Yo, what's up, fellas and ladies? This is the Best Damn Agency Podcast, where, as you guys know at this point, it is scientifically proven. Uh, all the theories test out. Uh, all the hypoth- or hypothesis check out. We are the number one digital agency podcast for sales. It's science. And so you can't question science. Obviously, we know that these days. Um, and again, to stay in that vein, I bring on badass guests to ensure that we are scientifically proven number one digital agency podcast for people who want to grow. And so today I have a good friend and a badass agency owner, my buddy, Chris Dreyer of rankings.io. Drum roll. What's up, Chris? Jelly, thanks for having me, man. I'm, I'm psyched. Love yeah, talking man. sales, love talking about the agency. I know. And we also like just fucking around a little bit too. So yeah, we've had a couple <laughs> nights where we've masterminded, we've climbed mountains, we've ridden Polaris's and ATVs, and we've drank and... Some people in the room, you know, don't mind me saying this, but some people did edibles and it didn't end super well for them. So, you know, <laughs> we're, we're a little hey, uh, bunch of ragamuffins over here. The key is to be the front person of the ATV tour. So you don't get the dust. That is the damn truth because you were at the at the front. I was right behind you. So I, I got a little bit of that kickback, but you're about four to 10 you know, Polaris is deep or ATVs deep, you are caked in dust, <laughs> especially if you're going to Truth. Colorado where it's like just straight up dust and Silverton. So yeah, good, good advice. If you take nothing else away from this podcast, then know to always be at the front <laughs> of the line. Uh, well, dude, tell people about rankings. Um, you've obviously made a big splash with your agency, especially in the the SEO space and more specifically in the, in the, the legal SEO space. Um, Talk about what you guys are up to or just briefly what rankings does. And then I'll ask some questions. Yeah, we're a super niche agency, horizontal and vertical focused agency. We help elite personal injury attorneys dominate first page rankings. Essentially, we're a personal injury law firm SEO agency. And I would say the majority of our clients are fitting that mid-market they're seven figure, eight figure. We've even worked with, uh, you know, seven to eight figures mm-hmm. typically. Yeah. And you guys also charge a shit ton. <laughs> we charge, <laughs> we, we, we charge a lot more than most SEO agencies. Yeah. It's the PI space is super saturated. So it just requires a lot of production, but yeah, we like to say value, um, yeah. instead of cost, but <laughs> an investment, it's a value an investment. Here's yeah. your investment in your SEO. Help you dominate first page rankings. Truth. Uh, and you guys are, I mean, you're really killing it. We've worked together. We've been friends mm-hmm. for a while. You guys have, have done a fantastic job. One thing I love about what you guys are doing is you're going to crack 10 mil this year, I think. You're on a run rate for it. Pretty close. Uh, so 9 million stretch 10. Cool. Yep. You'll get there. Um and and one thing that's cool about that is you have a super lean team. Like you're not typically most agencies operate at about a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand a head. That's not the case for you because of the way you structured your company. Um, and I think that's super unique. You, it's the mm-hmm. team model, if I recall. Um, I'd love for you to kind of explain that because it's yeah. a unique model. We always think that we got to get warm bodies, W two, bring them in, mm-hmm. and then we just have a massive overhead. Uh, that's not how you do it. Yeah, we have a really different setup for our organizational structure. And if there's any blog written on organizational structures, I've probably read it. That's probably one of the things that I obsess about the most. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows you have to have enough people for utilization and fulfillment. You have to have the best people, the right people on the bus, the wrong people off the bus, all those types of situations. And what we do is we find strategic partners for the areas that require heavy production. If you think of E-Myth, like the technician, the manager, and then the owner, most of the technician work, the grinding grunt work is, is through our strategic partners. So being an SEO agency, we work with uh, Verblio, who's a phenomenal content partner. We have link building partners for uh, David Farkas at Upper Ranks. We work with uh, Siege Media. We have some just great relationships there. And then on the local side, we work with Logan X, um, a few other consultants there. It's and basically in turn, 
Our company is comprised mostly of strategists, account managers, and project managers, and not as many technicians. So it makes us really lean. We're at 19 people right now. And I would say, and you know this better than anyone, at our revenue, most agencies are going to have at least double the amount of people. Yep. And there are benefits of working with strategic partners because you get economies of scale. The more you spend, you can get big discounts. You can also be very objective in who you're going to be, who you're going to work with in terms of who's who's actually the best. Mm-hmm. If you hire an individual, you have to continually train them and hope they refine their skills versus piloting strategic partners every single month to figure out true who truly is the best. And I know many of you out there are scratching your head. You're thinking, oh, but all these strategic partners suck. Well, the thing is, it's just like anything when it comes to you know the iron triangle of three. You can have something that's um, you know high quality. Um, you can have some you know good, fast, or cheap, but you can't have all three. So you can have something that's good and fast, but it's expensive. You can have something fast and cheap, but it's not good. And you can evaluate your strategic partners in the same manner. Yeah, that's huge. And that's actually one thing I've always respected about how you you run st- your channel partners and strategic partnerships. So you, two things: you have referral partners, you have strategic partners. Strategic partner would be like a verb, Leo, right? Right. Um, so Steve over there. You guys are probably obviously a big client of theirs. And so that that also comes to leverage for you because you can say, hey, we're doing so much business with you. Then we can negotiate better rates, which helps your profit margin, still serves your clients, still serves Verblio because it climbs the scale. Absolutely. Not not only that, Joey, so we form a relationship mm-hmm. if, because we're spending so much and they'll actually hear from us on what would help us succeed. If we're just going to spend you know, two to $5,000 a month the strategic partner, they don't care what That's right. what that individual business has to say and how we can help them. But a bigger partner, they want to keep that relationship, keep the retention, and they want to know how to make it a win-win. Yep. Yeah, and I've learned that obviously being a pipe drive partner for the longest time, you know, we were just we had like an affiliate link and we'd send people there. But eventually, like as we started building out the entire sales operation of agencies, like we just built, we we dictate our agencies tech stack. And so because of that, we ended up saying, well, here's what the tech stack we're going to use. And we just started building these strategic partnerships with them. And they would take our request series for offers, right? Like there's some things about pipe drive that I was like, dude, why is this this way? It should be this way. And they like take it actually seriously and they'll, they'll escalate it up, which is a huge added benefit because it makes my job. Yeah. If they'll take that serious. That's huge. Absolutely. And, and Steve, I love Steve, the Verblio team. They're great. Mm-hmm. And I tell Steve, Steve knows I'm testing other partners. Right. So it, it's, it's very, if, if they're not the best and they start to fail on their deliveries, I'm going to go somewhere else. It's not a, Hey man, I, I like you or I don't like you type of situation. It's like, I need this for my business. Yeah. And it, you're bringing a lot of revenue. So it's, it's a, it's a win-win for everybody. As long as everybody's at their peak of, you're providing a lot of cash. He's providing a great service. Your client's happy. You're happy. He's happy. It's it's absolutely iron triangle. So how do you structure your team then? So of the 19 that you do have internally, um, mm-hmm. what does that team look like? How do you, you know, I mentioned the T org chart. I don't know if you're still using that these days, but yeah. Uh, what is that? How does it work to some degree? Um, Cause I think, and we had Swank on uh, Jason Swank, uh, I believe two episodes ago. Uh, actually, it's mm-hmm. just this morning, but I record all these in one day. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Jason was on earlier this morning, two weeks prior to this, and he talked about like as you elevate in your agency and you get to certain levels, um, there is a level where you're essentially just managing the directors and managing the leaders, right? And that's I'm assuming that's kind of where you're you're at today, or at least close to it. Yeah, well, my my executive coach Carl Sakis, he talks about moving from mandatory to needed, to optional. Mm -hmm. And everyone wants to be a CEO that's optional where you can kind of look around, you have your head up and see where you can provide value as as opposed to having to be doing something at all times. You're needed, you're you're mandatory. Uh, Being optional has a lot of value. That's where you can go take a vacation for two or three months and the whole business doesn't burn down if you got those good processes. But yeah, we are a T-shaped business. I think in the digital agency space, specifically the SEO agency space, the big question is, do I use a pod or do I use a team? 
know, like traditional hierarchy. Now there's other variations, there's matrix and all these, but the most common two are a team structure. A team has a hierarchy, you know, they're in their silos of expertise and a pod would be cross-functional units. So the biggest reason why we're structured as a team, a hierarchy and our, our main, they're broken down by finance, marketing, sales, ops, and underneath ops, I've got accounts and fulfillment separate. So I don't have the account managers doing fulfillment. I have them just as client liaison and strategy. The biggest reason that we do it is because of how we're structured with our strategic partners. Because we outsource a lot of the fulfillment to these partners that will just contribute, you know, write a whole bunch of content for a whole book of business. If we were an agency that had most of the staff in house, I would highly look at, I would probably look at that cross functional pod. There's a lot of benefits in terms of communication, clarity, alignment, cohesion. Um, you can make them self autonomous, right? Where they can even operate their own PL if you want them to. And I know some very successful law firms like the Mike Morse Law Firm in Michigan, which is the biggest Michigan law firm, uh, personal injury law firm. That's how they operate as a pod. No but you know, agency life is not it's not um, it's not plumbing where I have to pull people from the union and I only get X amount of people and they have these things and I get a higher local. There are what a hundred thousand digital agencies. I don't you would know better than me yes. that do exactly what I do, and I can find the experts in their space to supplement our offer. Yeah, I mean. Uh I, I envy your business model to some degree. I don't envy your market because it is super saturated. But then again, so is all digital agencies to some degree. <laughs> but I talk to more, or my, my team talks to more PI law firms or uh, SEO for, for you know legal every week. But I just think you guys differentiate yourself. I want to talk about that a little bit. So you I mean, you guys, obviously, you're, you're on a run rate of 9 million, stretch 10. Um, mm-hmm. You're not a super old agency. You're not like you've been around for decades and you just gradually got there. You kind of got there pretty quick and you've done it really mm-hmm. strategically and, and, and smart. Um, for you, if you're talking to another agency owner and, and they're in this position where they kind of feel stuck, they don't feel like they can delegate well, they don't know, you know, like, because if I recall, you kind of have like you at the top and then I believe a COO underneath you, right? And then you have mm-hmm. directors who are basically a straight line horizontally underneath them. If you're watching this, then you can watch this. But if, if you're listening, have you picture, been? You've been in my base camp looking at my org yeah. chart. Exactly. <laughs> and then, you, and then you've got your AMs that are directly down on your fulfillment and our ops side. And then, basically, mm-hmm. in those bottom two quadrants are your contractors. Right? Is that right? Nailed it. And I think it's a big. When you do work with a lot of strategic partners, we actually even include our strategic partners on our organizational structure uh, because we've got it built by function so they can clearly see who's doing what. Hmm. So you use your podcast uh, similar to me, which is one, it's brand and it's authority, but it's also it's a it's a lead generator, right? Like I, I don't bring people on here who I don't want to interact with to some degree after the podcast, right? You know, like I, I wouldn't yeah. bring you on, Chris, if I don't want to hang out with you afterwards, right? And and we've also done business together, so we we have that dynamic too. But I wouldn't bring someone on here just for the sheer fact of having someone on the podcast. I'm not trying to fill up. That's why I'm only doing one interview a week right now. Um, mm-hmm. But for you, uh, you use the podcast very strategically as well, and that's it's a big lead generator for you. Yeah, our podcast is our entire marketing flywheel. It's, and what I mean by that is any additional marketing element that we add, we, it, we try to see if it will supplement what we're already doing. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that, let's just talk about all the different aspects and I'll talk about how we're using it too. So a podcast is great for prospecting, right? We're giving value. It's a way to get our foot in the door to these big time attorneys as opposed to, you know, you know, cold calling or, or these other tactics. It's not to say that some of those don't work if you're very strategic about them, but I found that it's easier for me to get my foot in the door through a podcast and we can have a very personal conversation. I can see them. I can read their emotional cues on the call. I can take, you know, on the podcast interview. So 
it's very good at building relationships. And when we, when we do the podcast, we then chop up that podcast in, using repurpose house, mm-hmm. uh, shout out to Shana yep. where we break it up into, you know, 14 pieces of content, you know, audio social media, we transcribe the post, we, it supplements our email list and we use it in sales as a follow-up tactic. Yep. If a lead starts to go cold, it's just all of these different aspects of it. It's, it's what we're doing for paid ads and original content creation. I myself am not a guy that loves setting behind a keyword and can just bang out a 4,000 word blog article. Like, I just don't like that. Oh. I love getting interviewed by professionals like yourself and oh, you. or doing video. Yeah. But if you want me behind the keyboard, just banging out a long article, that's just not for me. Do it. No, it's not for me either. I yeah. mean, honestly, whenever I have those types of tasks on my to-do list, one, I, I kick myself and I'm like, dude, what the fuck are you doing this anyways? <laughs> like, you don't need to do this. There's people way better at this than you. So why are you doing it? And then two, it's just, it's draining. It's like, man, not only are you not the best at this, but you don't enjoy doing this. And so... 100%. Yeah. 100%. And, and, and uh, my last episode with um, Robert Nichols of uh, Rocket Station, which you would freaking love them. You should check them out. Mm. Okay. Rocket Station is this... I mean, I'm going to plug them because I just really believe in what they're doing. So there's there's virtual assistants, which we all know is popular, and there's this tidal wave. Um and so you can you can kind of identify things you want to delegate to the virtual assistant, and then you go find a virtual assistant, test them out, see if it works, whatever. Well, what these dudes are doing, dudes, there's not 800 employees, so it's not dudes, it's everyone. But what these people are doing is they come in, they assess your entire business, they document all of your processes that aren't currently documented, then they go and recruit and hire, or they, they bring to the top three candidates that fit those specific processes that they built. And then you hire them for 10 bucks an hour. Wow. That's nice. It's like, it's Love like a thousand dollar it. setup fee to build all those processes yeah. and to do the whole thing. And then it's 10 bucks an hour to employ these virtual mm-hmm. assistants to do the processes that they built. And they're managing those people in the back end. Love it. It's, that would save me a lot of time. Yeah. There's just so many <laughs> things that as he was talking in the podcast, I was like, dude, I have so many processes that are one, not documented and two, not delegated. Man. Game changer. I don't even know where I was going with that, but that's just how my mind works. I think I was going. No, that's great. Way. That's great. I mean, you got to have those for scale if you want to make yourself optional and no, not mandatory or needed. No, dollars blog. You're like, you can't do that, but you can do this. Yeah. And off the back of you do the podcast as your flywheel because that is kind of the main corner, if you want to call it like a cornerstone piece of content. It is. Or a pillar. Mm-hmm. Everything else is the micro content that spins off of that. It's huge. Yeah, the challenge is sometimes I don't have enough thought leadership because I'm the host and my guests stop talking most of the time. So there's some things that we have to adjust there. But it's just such a great strategy, even from a referral standpoint and your follow-up cadence, you can even implement some gifting type of things. So one of the things that we do is we send a, a custom bobblehead to every guest. And it's something they'll set on their desk. They'll tell people about, they'll laugh about it, they'll share it on social media. But every time that they see that, they're going to remember where they mm-hmm. where they obtained it. It's it is John Ruland's. It's it's an artifact on their desk. Yeah, I'm and in, in your space, like because of what you charge, you can. I mean, I remember when Josh was doing a bunch of stuff with you guys. Like, there's just a insane amount of budget for you to do really cool shit <laughs> that gets their attention. Yeah, you yeah, know and I mean? you really have to. You have to, right? Because everybody's bombarding them with the cold email and the calls and they they all have learned how to block those mm-hmm. so they've got secretaries their director of marketing that are filtering all the contacts and easily yeah you're not getting through without something that really stands out and mm-hmm. uh who's the who's the big i run into them all the time scorpion they they're everywhere. yeah you know they do a lot of that gifting strategy as well i think um yes just- small agency about 250 million yeah whatever <laughs> Screw those guys. No, I'm kidding. Uh, maybe you'll come on the podcast. Who knows? Um, so what else are you up to, man? Like you're you're crushing it. You got goals. Uh, I do know you mm-hmm. invest in real estate on the side. I talked to uh, Justin Christensen three episodes ago about his, he's been throwing some money into real estate mm-hmm. as well. Um, okay. For you as an agency owner, what are you thinking about moving forward? Like what's your 
quote unquote exit strategy if there is one? Where do you want to be mm-hmm. five years from now? What's what's that looking like for you? Yeah, I'm not looking for an exit yet. I want to get my top line up a lot more. I want to make sure that I'm definitely optional. I'm still kind of in the weeds on just a couple major accounts that I've been with since, you know, we've got some six figure SEO retainers Mm -hmm. and that's monthly SEO retainers that I'm highly involved in. I need to have the, those are just really difficult uh, to transition. And what I was going to say is, I'm basically using the net profit to supplement the real estate. So yeah, I'm a, I'm I'm very passionate about that. I think of real estate as buying SEO retainers where the instead of having to do month to month contracts, I get year long tenants that are conditioned for a uh, monthly or a raise in their fees every year. Yep. And there's just so many advantages, but right now the agency we're <laughs> we have one of those good problems to have. We are not our our lead to booking percentage is not at an acceptable rate right now. So we're looking at hiring an inbound SDR yeah. that most of their time is just setting and qualifying appointments, doing some follow-up, maybe doing outbound. Uh, I, I like to segment them where they only do inbound and then I have a different person for outbound, but outbound. yeah. yeah. Um, so that's, that's a big thing that we're focusing on. The other large focus is trying to reduce the number of accounts that our account managers have. And we have three right now, and we would like it to be even less because everyone knows how important warmth is to relationship in terms of retention, especially for an SEO agency where the results aren't immediate, where you have to really set expectations and, and guide the ship in that six to month to a year long journey before they really start to see a great return. So we're trying to reduce down to six to eight accounts at most. Now, obviously, that depends upon the revenue. If we have a super very large account, maybe it's just one or two that they manage. But that's one of our big objectives right now. That's huge. Yeah. And, and I know that it, uh, especially with the what you charge and the types of people you get on, it's a lot of work for just one account. Yeah. And on top of that, just managing the strategic partners too, where they're for sharing. Sure a lot of content and all the goodies. Mm-hmm. Um, well, outside of that, like for you, when, when you're thinking about like your day to day, what, what does it look like when you get to this level where you've got your directors, you've got your COO, you've got your AMs. I know that you're, you're still stuck kind of managing one or two accounts just simply because it's super um, delicate and massive because I, I know mm-hmm. the numbers there. Um, What's your day-to-day look like? Like at you as more of what I would consider like a, an actual CEO of an agency. I can't say that about most people who have the title CEO. Sometimes I question what, whether I've earned the CEO title in my business, but we'll see. Um, an actual CEO who's kind of sitting over top, what does your day-to-day look like? And how do you think about the business on a day-to-day basis? I'll tell you a few things that are different that might be helpful is I theme my days I have Monday meetings, Tuesday account management for those key accounts, Wednesday marketing, Thursday podcast, and then I have a Friday free day. And the first thing is I really control the calendar. If it's in the calendar, it's real. If it's if it's not in the calendar, it's not real. And I'm very, you know, inbox zero, very diligent about that. My day-to-day is mostly giving the support to my directors that I need. And trying to help if I'm not coaching or training them, trying to get them external coaches. So Brett Harnd, coach our director of operations, who's now our VP of operations for a few years. I've got uh, you know Nathan Gotch, who has uh, an SEO training academy, training up our director of accounts. And uh, I've got my president in Vistage, and he's in COO Alliance with Cameron Herald CEO Alliance. So all of them are just getting a tremendous amount of support and external coaching to really thrive in their roles because it kind of passes down from the top to your other employees. That's, that's a huge focus. The other big focus, and it's because of what I like. And fortunately I'm at a place more now where I can focus on what brings me passion more so than what I have to do. I, I really enjoy doing a lot of the marketing and biz dev 
So I'll jump on some sales calls to kind of shake, shake things up. I'll very, very active in doing interviews and podcasts and webinars and, and all those types of uh, relationship building activities. A lot of biz dev. Hmm. I love it. You know what I love also is making money. And so I'm going to pitch one of my, <laughs> my masterminds. So uh, for those of you guys who are listening, I have and am launching what we are calling the best damn agency mastermind because we are arrogant and we're confident that we are creating the best damn agency mastermind, just like we have created the best damn agency podcast. Cause again, it's, it's science at this point. So, uh, what is the best damn agency mastermind? Well, it is a collective of a curated group of agency owners who are doing big things, um, who are very growth minded, who want to take things like sales, like legit hardcore sales, seriously to grow their agency and they want to do it with other like-minded people around them to challenge them uh, and encourage them uh it is the best damn agency mastermind because it's the best damn agency mastermind i have things built into the mastermind to ensure and keep me accountable to make sure that, that is what i'm building and i'm living up to the name um and so if you are doing if you're either getting close to seven figures and you're kind of on that rocket ship or you're at seven figures or eight figures um, I want you to consider having a conversation with me um, about the mastermind. Here's the unfortunate thing. I don't get the final say because this is the best damn agency mastermind. Even someone uh, whom you might know by the name of Chris Dreyer, who's a guest on the back end <laughs> of where I'm at right now. Uh, we have a council on the mastermind who, even if I want someone in there, they have to get the final say. And we've got a collective of, I think, 25 million or so in annual revenue on that council who's making that decision. So we are legitimately building the best community. So if you want to be around people who are kicking ass, um, who are building businesses just like yours and probably have better businesses than yours, that's going to help you sharpen your sword, then come check us out for the Best Damn Agency Mastermind. Um, currently go to salesdrivenagency.com, book a call. Um, when you book a call, you'll talk to our team. Talk to our team. If it's a good fit, they'll put you in front of me. If you're a good fit after talking to me, I will put you in front of the council um, and pitch you to them. And then if you get in, then you can finally be a part of the best damn agency mastermind. So I'll stop pitching me and get back to my guests who uh, I'm actually excited to be in the mastermind. So had to love it, it, man. Had to pitch it. Um, love it. Man, I appreciate you a ton. And, and one thing I love about you is I do think that you're a giver. Um, for you, I don't know if it's something that you've just philosophically believed, right? You're obviously super competitive. We're all super competitive. We're all ex athletes, you know, at least me, you, and some of the other guys that we hang out with. Um, but you're also a giver to some degree. And so there is that like killer instinct, but then you're also one of those like abundance mindset, I'm assuming. So I kind of want to go that, yeah, definitely that route a little bit. So I want to get out of just the nuts and bolts of agency. And I want to talk more about like you as like a, as a man, as a human. How have you gotten to this point? Like, is it mindset training? Is it is it mentors and coaches? Is it mastermind? Like, what is it that you can attribute to like how you've gotten to where you're at? Jeez, it is a mindset thing. It's it's been passed on to me from great coaches and great leaders. And it's giving without expecting anything in return. I'm not a super spiritual person or anything like that. And but I think that if you put good energy out, I think that it has the ability to, to return to you. And that's why I do it. it. It makes me feel good too. When I help someone, I know that individuals have different stressors. And if I've had a problem and I've learned from something in the past, I love to, to kind of share those experiences. Those can be fun. And it also, I think, helps to build relationships with you know, someone like yourself and if if I hit you up on Slack, you know, I, I know you're gonna get back to me. And it's it's not why I do it to like just give away, but it it's it's a relationship builder and totally. I get to meet get cool people, help people, abundance mindset. And what's interesting, and I didn't even come to this realization, but that's really how I grew my business. In the beginning, I didn't have any marketing or sales. I was doing owner-based selling selling, and I was just very strategic about. Hey, we may not be the right fit for this person, but someone is. That's the mindset I had. Yep. It wasn't like I was trying to sell every prospect that came in the door. And that helped me really grow. And it wasn't, it was just being, you know, having, I guess, holding integrity really tight. Mm. And that was passed down family values, things like that. 
totally. Yeah, I, and for me, I've I um, I realize that business in general is eighty percent mindset, twenty percent skill set, hundred percent luck half the time, which makes it fifty percent, I guess, half the time. <laughs> Whatever. Eighty yeah. percent mindset for me. You lost me. I got lost too, dude. I don't know the hell I'm at right now. <laughs> no, what I'm really getting at is like for me. And, and I have to instill this in my employees and, and more specifically, like my performance employees, my salespeople is, is you, you have, you have put the ceiling on yourself, whether it be you have physically put it on yourself because of your, your beliefs about yourself or someone else has put it on you. And it's your job to, to release yourself from that ceiling or that self-limiting belief that you have, um, which takes practice. Like Hunter. I'm sure there's some point in your career where you're like, I, you didn't think that you were going to be running a $10 million a year agency. And I'm sure now you have much bigger goals, right? And you, you, even today you have a self-limiting belief. I do too. I had, you know, I have a, a, a really big net worth goal that I want to get to, uh, before I turn 40. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got a little bit of time, but I, I set a cap kind of where I want to be. And one of my coaches was like, well, I just stopped there. I was like, ah, I don't know. I think it's just cause I don't think I can get above that. He's like, then you won't. <laughs> and I was like, hmm. shit. <laughs> yeah. So do you, yeah. do you do anything? Like you're a massive reader. So that's one thing I've always also respected about you. I, I follow you on Goodreads, um, which is a terrible idea because I, I, I feel bad about myself, about how, how little I'm educating myself compared to Chris Dreyer. <laughs> um, w- I mean, do you do like mindset practice? Do you, do you have any sort of discipline around like really challenging yourself? That's a great question. And I love where it's going. I I do have a habit for learning every single morning. I dedicate at least an hour to either listening to a podcast or reading or listen to an audio book. And that's every single morning. I really enjoy it. It's I'm by myself. It's quiet. And so that's a habit that's really helped me in terms of I definitely have limiting beliefs too. I think that anyone that says they don't is, I mean, it's some people's limiting beliefs are much higher than mine. Some are lower. And I've been listening to bigger pockets podcast where I think it's Brandon, Mm -hmm. Brandon Turner. Turner. And he talks about how he has a performance coach and the performance coach challenges his limiting beliefs to set the bar higher. And I was like, Oh, that's a really, because my coaches right now are more about accountability and helping me arrive at a decision, not necessarily pushing me to think beyond what my limitations are, which is more, uh, I believe that individuals at, at part of the Tony Robbins, you know, coaching type of club. And I think that the education part of it, it's allows me to see more opportunities. So I think it kind of raises those, those ceilings a bit. Uh, I'm listening to Patrick Bet David right now, and he's just got me so fired up that, of course, I know a lot of people love him or hate him, Grant Cardone, but you just sure. can't. I mean, that dude, it's he's just he outworking what he's his done. work ethic and what he's done. And so I just, I really look up to those types of individuals and who are just getting it done with execution. The difference between a entrepreneur and an entrepreneur is execution, everyone's got ideas. Yeah. Oh, I thought of that idea two years ago. <laughs> you know, you've heard that <laughs> exactly. before. Ideas don't pay the bills. Right. Um, you know, there's a Ed, Ed Milet. I don't know if you've listened to him at all. Oh, yeah. Love it. One, one of my favorite uh, virtual mentors, if you want to call him that. You know, obviously, he doesn't know who I am, but I know him and I listen to him. And, and I, mm-hmm. I, I look at him as a mentor to me to some degree because of the way he's just impacted my life, by the way that he's impacted my mental, right? Like, I think for me, um, I had self-limiting beliefs on where I'd be still do. Right. But uh, there, the bar was much lower at one point. And, and he started talking about like the biology behind like your mind is super mm. fat. I don't, we're going down a weird path that has nothing to do with agencies, but it has everything to do with agencies. Um, where he talks about there's, there's a bundle of neurons at the top of your brainstem called the reticular activating system. And it is the most fascinating thing about the brain, in my opinion, because uh, average human has 75,000 thoughts that get into their brain in one day. Average human, 75,000. We're obviously not aware of 75,000, but we are aware of you know 10% of that. 
why are we aware of those 10% versus the other 90? The particular activating system is, is a, a bundle of neurons that his entire goal is to be the filter and gatekeeper to the conscious brain, what you're aware of, um, which I, I find super fascinating when you start thinking about it. So you're like, well, why, am, why is it choosing these 10% and not these 90? And, and what people talk about is, is the reticular activating system's job is to be the filter or gatekeeper that bubbles to the top or to your conscious brain the uh, the things that support your core beliefs, that support your belief system. And obviously there's the the support your survival, right? There's those two things. And and so what that he, what Ed Milet ended up start talking about was that means that in order to change your what you're aware of, you have to change what you believe. And you have to force yourself to start believing something. That's why people talk about like affirmations and they talk about like um Here's a good example of a reticular activating system. You uh, right now, I'm I'm looking at an Audi R8 um, as as like my car. It's like it's always been a, a, a go-to dream car of mine. Uh, it's something I want. Um, mm-hmm. I started researching them a lot more, and sure as shit, I see them a lot more. Right wow. now, it's not a very common car, but they've probably always been there to some degree. And now, because I've been researching them, and it's my belief that I want one. I see them everywhere. It's the same thing you shop for a Toyota, you know, a Tundra or a Ford F-150 or a a Forerunner. It's not like everyone just went out and bought an F-150 all of a sudden. It's that you now believe you're going to have an F-150. You believe that you want an F-150 and now you're seeing them everywhere because that is your reticular activating system bringing it to the forefront of your brain. Oh, that's so awesome. I I, I can think of actual examples there. And I shout out to Ed. I wish, I wish Ed would have, um, his max out book. I've been trying to get that. I'm just gonna have to order it online. Mm-hmm. I've been cruising the Barnes and Noble, but uh, they just don't carry it as much. So I need to get that book, Ed. Yeah, seriously. Send it over to Chris. I'll, I'll make a call to the guy who has no idea who I am. <laughs> um, but that's what's, I mean, for me, all that to say, and what Ed makes a good case on is biologically, you can train your reticular activating system. Right. And it starts with you have to train your belief system. And so if you believe that negative things are going to happen, it's not that negative things are all of a sudden going to happen to you. It's that the negative things are now the things that are at the forefront of your mind. And so therefore you're noticing them. Same thing with positive things. Um, and same thing why like speaking things into existence, though that's a little woo-woo Tony Robbins-esque. Biologically speaking, it's not even in the spiritual realm at this point. It's biologically speaking. If you start believing something, your brain is trained to see the things. And so if you believe I'm going to be successful in this way or this or that way, your brain is bubbling to the surface, your conscious brain, the things that lend to and support that belief. And so maybe you Love notice it. the opportunities. Maybe you notice the, uh, the conversation across the room that you wouldn't have heard otherwise. Right. And so I mean, it's science. I'm all about the science Love it. this podcast. Love so, it. Love it. All I have to say, I don't know where I'm going with that other than I think a lot of agency owners have this, and, and myself included, and, and, and you to some degree, we all have this. We limit ourselves to our ability to what we can can actually achieve. And so for all of you who listen to the podcast, for the tactics and the silver bullets and the strategies, like the most important thing you could probably take away from this is that you are probably in your own way and you don't even realize it. And I, yeah, let, let me tell you an actual example yeah, of this, Joey. Please do. That I, this is an actual example of what you're referring to that I still question myself to this day. And I, so we do personal injury SEO and we've got a good client base. And I'm thinking, okay, well, they pay per click is a good service for these individuals. If it's done properly and managed properly, they can generate an ROI. So should I do PPC? You know, will it affect my niching, my branding, perception, all those things? So I ended up creating a department for pay-per-click, tried it for a little bit, and then decided, and we were profitable, sold five or six accounts, and just decided that it was not for us. Sure. And the question that I've asked myself is, was it the wrong decision to open this up, or did I not execute it properly? Did I get in, get in the way? Did I not hire the right person? Did I not give them the correct resources to succeed? So was it truly the best decision to go back to PISEO or did I just not execute properly? So that's one of those things like maybe I had a limiting belief that in terms of... Um, or maybe I just, I just 
simply failed. And I think of Michael Masterson's book on Ready, Fire, Aim. I, I know you've read that one. Mm-hmm. And these different levels where, you know, zero to a million, you need to get a product or service and just sell, sell, sell. And, you know, figure out your process and sell it. But from a million to 10, you're now in that range where, you know, maybe I need to offer a complimentary service, a cross sell or an upsell. And so I'm kind of in that situation in that bubble, you know, now where I'm at the the 10 to 100 mil. And it's like, man, did I, was I the person that failed? So it's kind of hard, but I think it's important to look at those situations in retrospect. Yeah. I think it's, I think you're right. I mean, it's in the gym. I'm just not a, I'm not a legs guy, you know, it's like, well, you could be, if you, if you put in the execution, the plan to execute being a legs guy. Um, I see it all the time. The agency world. I, I'm just, we're just not a sales. Like I'm just not into sales or I can't do sales. It's like, well, yeah, you're right. I mean, the guy who says he can, and the guy who says he can't are both right, you know? And so mm-hmm. you're right. And so I, now, I'm not shitting on the fact that you stopped doing PPC. Like, I love your niche and I think you do fantastic there. Honestly, you should probably just go buy a PPC agency and make it real easy for yourself. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Self limiting beliefs is uh, I can't do that. Well, now you can't. Um, so, yeah, man, I, 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 I don't know how we got in the mindset stuff, but it's super important. And I think mm-hmm. it, it excites me when people start seeing that. Like, for me, when I'm shepherding my salespeople, uh, I've got one specific sales guy. He's just got all the goods. Chris, you've talked to him. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got all the goods. He's got the natural talent. He came to me. He hadn't even been in sales, right? He's been he was a nonprofit full time ministry for seven years and wasn't even in sales. And he's been with us for like seven months. He's already way positive on our mind. <clears throat> but his biggest issue has been his his mental. Like he just comes from this <clears throat> scarcity mindset. Like again, he's got all the goods and the tools, and 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 the one thing he lacked was was or the one thing that was his biggest issue was himself he'd, he'd get his own way and think he's not good enough or i don't have enough experience or you know and then when you start peeling away those onion layers and you start actually like pouring into the individual to like no dude like this is you are setting those limits on you no one else is and when you start taking those limits off like you start watching him kind of become his own you know like come into himself and, and really actually start performing and owning his success which is super cool and so whether it's you, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, whether it's you that needs that or it's or it's your people, mm-hmm. like that's on you. That's your responsibility as the CEO, the agency owner. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. And there's just that simple saying: competency builds confidence. Mm-hmm. So if he's doing great, you know whatever it is that you're doing, you start to become more confident. Start to try other of things. Of course. Yeah, I also think that you know. I also look at myself do these retrospectives on, am I becoming too comfortable? Yeah. And I know my director of finance and a lot of my teams are like, hell no, you're not. You're the complete opposite, right? <laughs> but, but I question myself because sure. what I'm willing to do is different. Their level of tolerance, uh, okay. risk. Or, and by the way, being an entrepreneur, uh, th- that itself kind of frustrates me because if you have a good plan and you execute it, there's not a lot of risk. Um, so I think that term gets thrown around a little incorrectly, but I think, you know, can I crank this up? Like what, what is my level of to where I, I just can't handle it? I, I want to feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Getting comfortable with uncomfortability. I've heard said once I'm like, man, that's pretty damn good. I'm write yeah, that somewhere. for sure. Uh, <laughs> man, we can go all day on this. I want to finish off with a round of random. It's a lot of fun. Okay. Uh, get a little bit more personal here and then we'll get you out of here. Top of the hour. So first four or first question I like to ask people, if you could leave where you're currently at in O'Fallon, Illinois, uh, just outside of St. Louis and, and teleport to anywhere, where would you go right now? Right now, Clearwater. I'm going next week. And I know that's like not a somewhere a foreign country, but I'm, I live, I've lived a sheltered life, I guess. I've been to mm-hmm. Canada. I haven't been to Mexico. So <laughs> I love clear water. You know, put me up in the Sand Pearl Resort. resort I'm good. Dude, if, we, if you can make it over to Orlando when me and Marty are going to be down there next week, we should hang out. Or maybe we'll come nice. to you. Yeah. Um, all right. If you could have dinner with anyone in the world, living or dead, who would it be? And why? I, I feel like I have to give two because, I, of well, course, I'm going to say Elon, I'm right? I'm going to say Elon. Uh, Musk is number one. Jeez, number two. 
living or dead? Gosh, this is going to be another boring answer, but it would be Rockefeller. Um, yeah. Have you watched that series? Yeah. I think it's on Amazon Prime. Maybe it's uh, oh, amazing. Men who built this or something like that. Men who built America. amazing. Yeah, Loved fantastic. it. All right. If you could build another business, and dude, I know you have thousands of businesses. You and I've talked about how many domains you own. If you could build any other business other than agency, what would it be? Is it still the cobbler? <laughs> 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 Cobbler Co. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> um, it would be around real estate. It's yeah. so kind of where I'm at. I want to, I've looked at opening Remax franchises because I'm getting tired of paying those percentages for my realtor and I want it to come back. And then the property management company for economies of scale and opportunities for prospecting. It would definitely be around there. There's just so many benefits, especially right now with where the rates are. Totally. Now that can, they could, uh, I expect them to totally blow up, but that's probably what I'd do is real estate. Makes sense. That's been a couple of people. I think Justin's was the same thing. All right. If you and I yep. went out to dinner, which we, we will in the future anyways, but if you and I went out to dinner and I'm paying, where in the world are we going? What's your favorite restaurant? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. It'd be seafood somewhere. I'd probably, I'd probably go over to somewhere in Massachusetts, get some good lobster. Yeah, a little, little uh, lobster bisque or some clam chowder. Oh, yeah. I went to Salem. What was it? Salem, Massachusetts with uh, with the wife. It was uh, the second part of our honeymoon. We went to Maui, then went to Salem. Nice. And I had Very so many places. lobster. <laughs> totally, totally different. <laughs> <laughs> West, east, yeah. And uh, ate so many lobster rolls. It was just amazing. Wow, so There's this, you know, Midwest. It's like, not. Nah, it's hard to get good seafood. I'm fasting right now, so now I'm just salivating over here. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. All right. Uh, last one before I get you out of here. What uh, What are you irrationally passionate about outside of business? You're not allowed to say business or books. Oh, geez. Irrationally passionate. Or very, you know, it was pretty passionate about outside of work. I have an idea, but. Uh, college b-ball, I guess. That's true. Uh, UNC Here's basketball. I'm a, no, no. Let me throw it. Look, look, look over here. Hold up. I got to do this. Probably Star Wars. I'm a giant Star Wars nerd. Our entire orientation training. Our orientation has so many Star Wars memes and just weird Star Wars stuff. And then our day two, they start a Jedi Academy that has different functions that they go through. It's super weird, but uh, <laughs> I've kind of brought that into the work life. You know, JJ sent you a Mandalorian thing. Huh? Yes. Yes. I was like, I was so crushed because I received that. And I'm like, this is one of the best gifts I've ever received. And I don't know who sent it. <laughs> For context, that was my uh, senior sales guy, JJ. Yeah. Amazing. Sent him that. Um, Cool, man. Dude, I, I love you, brother. I'm I'm super thankful for our friendship. Thank you for coming on and sharing. Same, buddy. Um, excited to have you as part of the council, the mastermind. Looking at Yes, sir. Time. 